uh, Bhavanshi Dubey, the Vice President of the Sorry. BA Program Students Council, will be the moderator of this panel. As Franklin Roosevelt says, the only limit to our realization of tomorrow will be our doubts of today. So live your moments to the best without any doubts. With this very thought in the, uh, mind, I wish you all a very cheerful morning. We are honored to have the ma'am ma with us today in our very second home, Sri Venkateshwar College. To continue further, I would like to call upon Ravinder Khattar, President of the Program Department, to welcome. Thank you, Bhavansi. Good morning, everyone. Respected Principal, Professor C. Silla Reddy, and guest of honor, Yamini Ayer, ma'am, respected members of the faculty, and my fellow friends. It is indeed an auspicious occasion that the BA program committee is hosting the Diamond Jubilee Lecture. Madam, currently you are heading the Center for Policy Research and it is one of the leading policy research institutes in the country. It is a pleasure to have you among us. Your meaningful interventions in the public policy have resulted in a lot of change in the social sector. On behalf of my respected teachers and my dear friends, may I extend to you a warm welcome to our institution. As the head of our institution, our principal ma'am has been highly supportive to our initiative. May I welcome you too ma'am to this function. I extend my warm welcome to all the members of the faculty as well as our talented and signing alumni who have joined us. Last but not the least, I extend my warm welcome to all my dear friends in the college who have turned up for this event. Welcome you all once again to this event. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ravinda, for the welcome. Now I'd like to call the coordinator of BA program department, Dr. Krishna Kumar, sir. Sir, no Principal Professor C. Sheila Reddy, uh, President and Chief Executive of the Center for Policy Research, Ms. Yamni Ayer, my respected members of the faculty, and uh, my very dear students. It's indeed a pleasure and a proud moment that in a building which is named after Durga by Deshmukh, uh, who was highly concerned about issues relating to social welfare policies in our country, coincidentally we have uh, at another person uh, who over a long period, over a long journey had made a name in the world of public finance, in the world of public policy making in our country through her interventions since say 2008. I thought I should speak without looking at the paper, without looking at anything, I should speak about what is the differentia specifica of a group of public policy specialists who emerged in our country in the course of the latter part of 2000 to 2010 period, when huge distributive disparities were on the upswing, there was a large demand for upscaling, upscaling facilities in primary education, health, etc. But along with it, there emerged another problem with respect to enhancing the effective delivery of public services through her various interventions, particularly with a focus on primary education. I would not say that her focus or the focus of the accountability initiative which she mentored at the Center for Policy Research was purely on primary education, but on aspects of gender planning, on aspect of, aspects of rural and urban unemployment, on issues of minimum wages, on all issues where numbers matter, where sometimes the economist they're there to tread with, with some sort of a different attitude, with some sort of a conservative attitude, which was not warranted. In fact, the intervention from the part of rights-based policy activist really had an impact with respect to public policy changes in our country, particularly in the effectiveness of the enhanced delivery of services. Of course, much is to be desired, but we should remember that in the 90s, far from what was in the 90s, 
there is a lot which we have been able to achieve also but every new step results in a new problem from one we have now issues in higher education we have now issues related to pandemic induced reduction in learning outcomes etc which are serious concerns and i really think it's a beautiful blend of multiple disciplines from which she garners her strength that policy public policy activists like Ms. Yamini Ayer has been able to make an indelible impact and he has now come here to our college as the President and Chief Executive of the Center for uh, Policy Research. And we are very happy that in the Diamond Jubilee year of our college, we have Ms. Yamini Ayer to deliver the Diamond Jubilee Lecture. And welcome uh, Ms. Yamini Ayer to the college. And may I now request the principal, before she makes the opening remarks, to hand over the moment to appreciation of our college to Ms. Yamini. without our guardian, our protector, our principal master, Mr. Shri Srila Reddy. So I would like to call her to say a few words. Uh, distinguished chief speaker of this session, Ms. Yamini Arya, uh, DA program coordinator, uh, Dr. Krishna Kumar, uh, other uh, esteemed faculty who have joined this uh, event, and dear, dear students. A very, uh, first of all, I extend a warm welcome to our uh, eminent resource person, uh, Ms. Yamini Ayer, uh, who is the, the President and Chief Executive of Center for Policy Research. Indeed, it is an honor that you have accepted our invitation this morning uh, to be here with us. And uh, definitely, it would be a very enriching and insightful session. And it is a very pertinent topic that has been given to her that Indian welfare state at the rate of 75, as we uh, have celebrated the 75 years of uh, independence as Azadi Ki Amrut Mahotsav, uh, the Indian constitution, uh, uh, according to chapter four, that is Directive Principles of State Policy, declares India is a welfare state. And articles 36 to 51, 51 give the different directive principles of the state policy. Uh, I think in today's uh, uh, session, the entire trajectory of the Indian welfare state would be tracked. So when we uh, reflect on the topic, that is Indian welfare state at the rate of 75, uh, many questions arise in our mind. Uh, some such questions could be, uh, See, we have had many welfare schemes in different governments and during different periods. How successful have been these welfare policies, measures, or schemes? And to what extent state intervention has been successful? And what has been the impact of uh, globalization, liberalization, and privatization, and ICT on the Indian welfare state? And we talk a lot about uh, transparency, accountability, and citizen-centric policies. So uh, how are we delivering on that front, uh, on this transparency, accountability, and citizen-centric policies? Or there is also a critic. Uh, nowadays, the welfare schemes are not merely welfare schemes. They are more of a populist schemes. And how honest and um, our review mechanisms are 
uh, do we monitor them uh, effectively and efficiently? So these are some of the questions uh, which come to our mind. Uh, when we talk of governance of India, governance is not an easy task in India. It is a very complex exercise given the enormous amount of diversity and the nature of social fabric of our country. So there are so many pulls and pressures uh, and it is indeed a challenging task uh, for the government to balance the diverse forces and to move ahead in the trajectory of the growth uh, that we have envisioned for ourselves and to channelize our efforts in the right direction. So it ha is, the topic is very uh, important. Uh, it is right time to discuss on that and deliberate. And uh, sincerely, and I'm very uh, confident that uh, Ms. Yamini Ayer is the right person uh, heading such a, an important uh, public policy think tank. She would have many inputs to share with you and answer many of your doubts and uh, queries which you have which you are bothered about and which have been troubling you so far. So with this, I once again welcome you uh, to this session. And as we have told, this is the Diamond Jubilee year of Sri Venkateshwara College. And indeed, it is an honor for BU program course to have you for this Diamond Jubilee lecture. Welcome once again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now is the time that for the, the reason which we have gathered here for, I request Yamini ma'am to kindly take over. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me here and for that very, very warm and generous introduction. It really um, humbled me and made me feel uh, extremely gratified. Uh, the field of public policy or the profession of public policy itself is a new and evolving one, which as a profession, I think, uh, raises many questions uh, about what it, what it means to engage with the state try and work with the state, sometimes maybe even be part of the state, uh, to push the state towards uh, just, inclusive, and participatory policy making. And uh, it's often a very diffused thing. So it's very difficult to explain one's identity as a public policy professional. And uh, so it's, it, it, it makes me feel very humble and gratified to know that uh, some of this work is understood, appreciated, uh, and also valued, uh, especially amongst those who are not part of the state. Because I do think that the most important role that public policy professionals play is the privilege of being the interlocutor. So you're not part of the system, you're also perhaps not completely outside of it, therefore you understand to a degree its constraints. But because you're not part of the system, you have the freedom and in fact, you have the professional, in uh, you owe it to the profession to allow your research and your observations uh, to speak for themselves and allow integrity and truth to matter above all. Uh, and I think that's at the heart of what makes for a public policy professional. I hope one day you'll call me to talk about what it means to be a public policy professional too, because that is, that's a question that, uh, that bothers me a lot and I think a lot of us uh, can learn from uh, all of you um, especially uh, our, our young uh, selves, and allow integrity and truth to matter above all. Uh, and I think that's at the heart of what makes for a public policy profession. I hope one day you'll call me to talk about what it means to be a public policy professional too, because that is, that's a question that, uh, that bothers me a lot, and I think a lot of us uh, can learn from uh, all of you, um, especially uh, our, our young uh, colleagues who are about to enter the professional world, how they view these things and what they mean. Uh, so thank you. Um, as I was, I, I was saying uh, to Principal Ma'am and uh, Mr. Krishna Kumar sir that I last walked into this campus now a very long time ago. Uh, none of you were born then, um, to, uh, uh, even though you're alumni. Uh, to uh, put in my application for uh, my BA degree 
uh, as it turned out, the uh, gates of North Campus opened up for me, so I ended up going there. Uh, but uh, I, I, it's, I, I've always uh, sort of, you know, Venki College was very much part of our DU life and all the festivals uh, that, that we were part and parcel of life in the North Campus as well. So it's always been a place that uh, one has engaged with in different ways and it really is an honor after all these decades uh, to have the opportunity to come back here, uh, not as a student, perhaps that's my loss, but uh, hopefully as somebody who can learn from all of you of the education that perhaps I missed out on. Um, I thought I'd sp uh, spend my time uh, talking to you a little bit uh, since it is the 75th independent moment of the 75th uh, closure, rather, of the 75th anniversary of India's independence, it's also been a moment of somber reflection of the path we've traveled over these 75 years. Um, and any kind of reflection on these 75 years or, or any period of time will always see a mix of good and bad. But importantly, there's a lot of lessons in looking back. Uh, to ask ourselves what is the direction in which we need to head into the future. As uh, uh, was said in my introduction, I have spent a lot of time engaging with uh, the question of social policy in public policy making. Um, and so I thought this would be a good moment to share with you some of my reflections, understanding, experiences um, of what it has taken to somewhat haltingly, I will say, and uh, we'll talk about that more, uh, tried to build a welfare state for India over these 75 years. And I will aim to end my uh, lecture by talking a little bit about what I see as the emerging contestations and the big challenges that we need to be careful about as we think about welfare going forward. So let me start uh, just with a little bit of an anecdote. All those decades ago when I came into Venki College to apply for admissions, it was also at a time which was in many ways the heyday of uh, uh, India, I, I, I would say, at least in, in my lifetime. The heyday of India in the sense that for all of us who lived in cosmopolitan environments in Delhi, the uh, opening up of the Indian economy, uh, the project of liberalization was slowly beginning to see some degree of fruit in very material ways. I mean, as a college student, uh, I must confess that I was quite frivolous and didn't really think of larger consequences of the state of the world. But the most exciting thing that happened to us was that the McDonald's opened in Priya Market, uh, Vasant Vihar, which I think still is a hot spot for all college students. Um, when we were in college, there was one cinema theater and lots of tickets being sold in black. Uh, and then there was suddenly McDonald's. It was, I can't tell you, the most exciting moment for uh, all of us. Uh, I think we must have been in second year college or maybe it was third year college by then um, because the McDonald's had opened and we had read in the newspapers about the long queues of people that were standing outside uh, waiting to taste this uh, amazing burger. And most of us had not left the shores of India. So for us, this was even more exciting. So 10 of us piled into one Maruti 800 uh, luckily, the police was quite relaxed at that time and nobody stopped us from being literally on top of the, uh, the, the, the roof of the car. And we made our way to stand for four long hours in that queue for the first taste of that McDonald's burger, which now I look at it and I think, God, it's so disgusting, I can't believe we stood for so long to eat it. But it was a really exciting moment. It was exciting because in so many material ways, uh, there was a big shift. Uh, the, the Indian state that used to dominate our lives, especially in the India Coffee House, which was the sort of place where young people would hang out, uh, no longer became that state dull place with stained tablecloths. Now there was McDonald's with a funny looking cartoon thing outside. Um, but it was exciting. It was the arrival of a new world. Campus recruitments changed suddenly. Uh, there was a lot of private sector companies that were coming in, actively selling the possibilities of a very lucrative future ahead of us. I'm one of three sisters. We used to have one landline, and to have three teenage girls in a house with one landline is an experience none of you will ever have. But I can assure you that it meant that we were always at war. We used to literally scratch each other's eyes out because everybody wanted the phone. Ek hi tha. So uh, around that time, finally, you know, there was a little bit more privatization of telecom. There were mobile phones coming in. 
suddenly we had more than one landline and over time we got ourselves mobile phones and since then my sisters and I are fast friends and now we have a WhatsApp group and we spend all our time chatting with each other and sharing photographs. Uh, but none of that would have been possible if the state had still been involved with that one phone line uh, for which also you had to wait for about 10 years before you got it. So in so many ways we were out celebrating the coming out party of India. Uh, the coming out party where the state was no longer holding us back and in fact we were literally being uh, liberalized and all our economic freedoms were being presented to us as, as these great opportunities. Um, and like I said, we were college students, we lived in a little bubble in Delhi, uh, we had our Maruti 800 into which all of us used to hang and our concerns were fairly material and fairly limited to the lucrative possibilities of our futures we didn't really think very hard about what all of this meant to anything else around us. Some years later, when I started working in an NGO, uh, I began traveling outside of Delhi, and my eyes opened to a very different context. Here we were celebrating the exit of the state and all the grand opportunities that the world, in fact, had opened up for us. Um, I went to do a degree in LSE and in Cambridge, and at that point, a lot of academics in the West were very concerned about globalization. And much of what we were taught about was about the inequities and possible colonization of globalization in countries like ours. Sometimes I think back to those classes and I look at what's happening to Western democracies and I wonder maybe we missed the bus there because we converted the, uh, the McDonald's burger into a paneer tikka burger. And I think to some degree we got on fine. There we have our problems and I'll come to that. Uh, but the inequities of the West have also created the kind of complex Trump-like policy politics uh, that we now see democracy headed in the direction of. Regardless, uh, as we started looking at the rest of India, I realized that in all these grandiose celebrations that we had of the state suddenly disappearing and opportunities uh, arriving at our doorstep, perhaps we were getting those opportunities because we already had the state and definitely had a huge leg up in the world. Everywhere I went, rural Rajasthan, rural Uttar Pradesh, rural Bihar, even rural Andhra Pradesh, uh, which were the places where I was working at the time, I constantly heard only one refrain. Sarkar aayegi, school banega, bache school jayenge, achhi nokri milegi. Sarkar aayegi, sarak banegi, market tak pohunchenge. At that point, I was working with an NGO that was working with self-help groups. So groups of women that were being mobilized to come together and these groups of women were being taught how to do little micro savings and lending amongst themselves. And one of the things that they were encouraged to do to earn a little bit of profit was to find ways of uh, you know, using these uh, uh, micro loans for small enterprises. So some tailoring work, uh, buying of goats for um, animal husbandry and so on. And when we would talk about kitna munafa hua, kaise karenge, business kaise banana hai, this story was always the same. Pehle sarak to bane, kyunki abhi hume paanch ghante lagta hai market tak pahunchne mein. Wahan pe pahunche to zyada time nahi hota hamare paas. Wapas gaon mein aana hai, kyunki ek hi bus hai. Aur wo bhi tooti hui sarak hai. I knew the sarak was tuta because my back broke trying to get there. And at that point I was a young 20 year old. So uh, it really must have been pretty bad. So it was a really stark contrast. There was this one part of India which was celebrating the exit of the state. And there was this other part of India that was de desperately searching for the state. And in this other part of India, it isn't that that other part of India was naive in any way. It recognized that there were many things that the state can do that were really, really problematic. It recognized that the state could be very corrupt. It recognized that in that corruption, the individual who needed the state the most was the one that was going to lose out the most. It thought of the state very much as a maiba. DM ki gari mein hum log jaate the upar niche lal batti hoti thi badi lambi awaaz aati thi beep beep ki puri sadak khali ho jaati thi hamare liye and on either side were people bowing to the my bab they were bowing perhaps because they knew that this was a source of power they also knew that this was the only power that would give them the opportunities that i was celebrating because finally the state was away it was an important personal reckoning for me of what the state actually is and it pushed me to ask, and that has been the purpose of a lot of my work, why is it that the welfare state, or the state that was supposed to build the school, build the road, build the hospital, and give the economic freedoms 
to all those that I was beginning to enjoy now without the state, um, that India has come to this point. And I want to reflect on some of this for all of you, because I think it is in these intersections of celebration of state exit and the urgency of state presence where the state matters the most is where the story of India's welfare state has actually unfolded. If you look back at our history, even in the years pre-independence, it isn't that India's founding fathers were unaware of the great tragedy of poverty and the great challenges uh, of poverty on socio-economic rights of individuals. This was a matter of great debate. Nehru, in fact, had argued that poverty in more ways than one was the great Indian tragedy. In 1931, in the Karachi Resolution uh, of the Congress Party, there was a statement, an explicit statement, on the importance of our economic freedoms as being central to what a sovereign, politically free nation could look like. It isn't as though there was a, 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 a blind eye turned to the challenges that free India would confront. The question really was, what was the most appropriate mechanism to move forward in a country that was slowly but surely and steadily moving in the direction of political freedom. In fact, if you look back at our pre-independence history and the starting point of our independence movement, social reform was also very much part and parcel of what uh, proved to be key forms of mobilization that coalesced in different ways into the independence movement. The infamous questions that Ambedkar and Gandhi debated on uh, had many deep questions about the evils or challenges uh, of poverty, of caste, of inequality that was in some ways at least embedded into the everyday of colonial Indian society. Historians will argue about whether this is a feature of colonialism or a feature of Indian society, but it existed nonetheless. And the real question was, what would role would the modern Indian state play in freeing all citizens from these unfreedoms that they were subjected to? Uh, many of which were a consequence of the challenges of colonialism and the lack of political freedom, but many which were also consequences of our own social context. There was a very lively and important debate in the Indian Constitution uh, during the Constituent, Constituent Assembly debates about how to locate socioeconomic freedoms. Like I said, our founding fathers or founding parents, as someone corrected me recently, uh, were not blind to this challenge. The question was, what would be the appropriate path? As we argued over our fundamental rights, uh, the question of socioeconomic freedoms or socioeconomic rights certainly came up many times in the Constituent Assembly debates. But I think eventually in the contestations over legal, justiciable nature of uh, socioeconomic rights, uh, the limitations of resources, given that India was a poor country, just on the uh, brink of becoming free and had to think about what kind of economy it want, wanted to become. And also perhaps the question of how do you actually justiciably enforce socioeconomic rights, which remained a puzzle. And you can see this in the trajectory of Ambedkar's thinking as well. Um, in, in some of the early debates in the Constituent Assembly, he argues very forcefully for the political centrality of socioeconomic rights in the Indian Constitution. Over time, he starts pushing more towards a legalistic argument, arguing about justiciability um, of, of socioeconomic rights, and also, uh, alongside with Ambedkar, others raise questions of resources. And it, e eventually, I think the balance was found in the directive principles, which, uh, as Principal Ma'am rightly said, uh, declare India as a welfare state and commit uh, the Indian state to a set of principles uh, for the well-being of all its citizens. But it choose, chose to place these very much in the, in the directive principles, not necessarily legally enforceable, but in the imagination of our founding fathers, that ultimately it would be the nature of politics that would place pressures on the, uh, on the power structures, on our politics, to respond uh, to and uh, abide by the directive principles. And Baker says so quite clearly, uh, in his speech in 1948, where he, uh, where he in fact argues uh, that people will elect those who have power, but the principles confer confirmed here will confine whosoever has power to not be free to do whatever he likes. As we embarked on our project of modernization, um, India sort of moved in a 
somewhat different direction in the sense of the imagination actually across the globe uh, uh, and, and, and also of the Indian state, which I sort of call the Nehruvian high modernism, uh, focused very much on centralized planning and building institutions, elite institutions, that would eventually contribute in and prepare the ground for mass education, mass health, mass welfare. The lack of resources was certainly part of the story, but the commitment to building these elite institutions and a particular centralized imagination also shaped uh, where India went in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. We built some of the world's best. We built the IITs, the IIMs in 1960. Venkateshwara College was built too. Uh, we, uh, we, we built some of the globe's best. And I think it is because of this that we have this peculiar best of all world, worst of times and best of times story of India, which is that you can have your Satya Nadelas uh, and you can own Silicon Valley. But at the same time, 50% of children that finish five years of schooling can re barely read a standard two text. The focus in our initial years was on building institutions. These institutions have held us steady and held us strong and have been very much part of a commitment that the average Indian has to the scientific temper, uh, to uh, a commitment to education, and a commitment uh, um, to high achievement. But what it did in the process was to I'm not sure the word ignore is the right one, but it didn't invest appropriately, necessarily at the time. After all, public policy is about choices. You can't do all at once. So a democratic choice was made to invest in higher, in, institu in elite institutions, rather than in mass education, mass welfare. Um, and uh, instead, there were a few sporadic, quote unquote, poverty alleviation programs that the government implemented every now and again. We were a struggling economy. We were, a build, we, were, we, were a, uh, we were an economy that was trying to build. And we were also working to ensure that we had political freedoms firmly enshrined for all Indians, socioeconomic rights to some degree, therefore, as Neil Jajayal very eloquently describes in her fabulous book, Citizenship and Its Discontents, I would urge all of you to read it, um, was sort of relegated to secondary status for the moment. Not that politics would forget it, but that it wasn't prioritized. Even ironically, in the 1970s, as politics shifted and Garibi Hatao became an important part and parcel of the, uh, of the global, uh, of, of the Indian political narrative. In fact, the coming of Garibi Hatao as an important part of our politics is a reminder that Ambedkar's original imagination that democracy would play a role, that politics would play a role, uh, held true. Ultimately, no political party or no form of politics could unfold in India without acknowledging the deep inequities and the deep challenges of poverty that India confronted. But India's democracy in this phase also evolved in unique and different ways. Perhaps because of this unique experiment of democracy uh, in a deeply unequal society, which many in the Western world had pretty much written off, frankly, uh, in 1947, uh, could a country as illiterate, as unequal, as feudal to some degree, uh, where institutions were still to be built, actually survive as a democracy? Could a country as diverse as India, with so many multiple religions, so many multiple re uh, regions, ethnicities, uh, languages, survive? And India proved all of them wrong. Our democracy survived, it thrived. But democracy in unequal settings also creates its own quirky moments for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, and one of the complexities of uh, democracy is that in more ways than one, political, the political sphere became an access to the state, became the primary mo uh, uh, mechanism through which power was accessed, exerted, especially for, for historically uh, 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 disempowered groups. Uh, and at the same time, that resulted in access to power as being the goal and primary dispensation of equity rather than uh, equ uh, 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 dispensation of socioeconomic rights. So if you see through the 80s, but more pronounced in the 90s and early 2000s, as lower caste mobilization, particularly in North India, became at the heart of our politics. Um, and in, in so many, in more ways than one, this is the true success, I would argue, of democracy 
that in fact it created the political moment for mobilization of hitherto disempowered uh, and marginalized historically uh, discriminated uh, group, uh, uh, parts of society to be able to access state power but it is that the access of state power and dispensation of power and patronage became the key mechanism through which power was exercised rather than convert itself into a deep engagement on socio-economic rights. All, however, was not lost. In the 1980s, uh, the project of uh, economic growth and liberalization began slowly to unfold. And also, parallelly, somewhat uniquely, I think, uh, you, we also saw a re-emergence of the challenges of mass welfare come into our political debate. This was and is the power of democracy. Tamil Nadu, for instance, this is about the time when Tamil Nadu experimented with the great and famous and life-saving midday meals that in the late 90s became a national scheme and an emblematic part of our right to food and our welfare state. Um, the new education policy, the second new educational policy was launched in, 90, in the mid-1980s and, um, be, and became the pivot for the launch of the Total Literacy Campaign, Operation Blackboard, and a number of state governments that began innovating with education. I should say that even in the 50s and 60s, actually going all the way back to the Bhore Committee Report of 1946, the challenge of health, education, delivering of public welfare was never ignored. Uh, a number of committees were set up to highlight many things that sadly we still talk, talk about today. Building a network of primary health care, building strong, robust primary, universal primary education with high quality education given to all in the Kothari Commission of 1966. These issues certainly were part of the political discourse and were debated, but little was done in terms of building the investments of the Indian state, particularly at the grassroots level, to be able to convert and translate these ideas into action. Perhaps, and I speculate here, one of the reasons why we didn't build enough of the grassroots state to do these things is because we also imagine the state, uh, but through the, uh, and, and that, that imagination is very prevalent in the Indian constitution, as being the primary vehicle for emancipation of Indian society, that it would be the tool for social change. And it always struggled with this balance of how embedded the state should be at the grassroots, so how much should you build at the grassroots, and how much of it should be an elite structure that comes in from the outside to navigate this process of social change. One of the consequences of this imagination is that we didn't think hard enough about local governments, uh, certainly all the way to the 93 constitutional amendments. We didn't think hard enough about the structure of the local administration. In fact, the big challenge was that the local administration partnered and collaborated almost too much with local elites to uh, dispense patronage and undermine the possibilities of, uh, uh, of delivering socio-economic rights to all citizens. And this conundrum remains central to the discourse of the welfare state in the 1990s. All these limited experiments uh, in building the welfare state that began to show up in the 1980s and 1990s coincided with the great moment of 1991 when India liberated and my friends and I began to celebrate the possibilities of McDonald's coming. Uh, oh, and there was also, thank God, it's Friday, for which we spent all our pocket money on. Even and today, I still don't understand why, but it was exciting at the time. Um, uh, and with that, of course, came the big challenge of the retreat of the state. So if you look at a lot of our data in terms of uh, how much of state employment India had over this period, it actually starts decreasing. So it's not that the Indian state didn't follow in the structural adjustment policies and the imagination of neoliberalism of a retreating state, but it was also neoliberalism being imposed in a democracy and in a highly unequal one, where economic growth made it politically unviable or politically unimaginable to pursue uh, only growth without some limited halting investments in welfare. Also, it's important to note that the global discourse had shifted a little bit. In fact, the mass expansion of elementary education came in the early 1990s as part of the structural adjustment program through the World Bank. And there was a very live debate that unfolded in India, which I traced along with some colleagues of mine uh, at the time uh, on, on how elementary education unfolded. There was a very live debate at the time as, as to whether or not the in, that India should be expanding its elementary education system on the basis of 
money, support, ideas, and imaginations that were coming from outside of India, we in our own self-reliance ought to be doing this quite rightly for ourselves. But I suppose money talks. And eventually, the Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan unfolded with some support from uh, uh, from the World Bank. But more importantly, the structure of these programs was in more ways very deeply Indian and built on a lot of the lessons that we had learned through the time of the Total Literacy Campaign, Operation Blackboard, Lok Jumbish, and many other state innovations that were unfolding, including, of course, the midday meals. So the period of the 1990s saw great growth. It also saw politics placing its own kinds of pressures, even as politics became a lot more about state patronage. It was also beginning to place its own kind of pressures, uh, democratic pressures that were bubbling from the bottom up on the state to be more responsive and to be more innovative. And civil society played a very, very crucial role, organized civil society, in mobilizing around what kind of welfare state the Indian state should, 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 should eventually move in the direction of. Perhaps it was politically impossible to have too much of India shining when much of Bharat was still stuck. And the pushback that came pushed our political narrative in a somewhat different direction. But this came also both with this coming together of civil society and the Indian courts, the Supreme Court in particular, through the instrument of public interest litigation, which began through an expansive interpretation of Article 21 to do what the Constituent Assembly and our Indian Constitution in 1950 hesitated somewhat to do, which was to move the process of bringing our directive principles back into, or move the process of bringing our directive principles firmly into socioeconomic rights. So the framework of rights as the basis upon which India would imagine the future of its welfare state began to be laid out by this coming together of civil society and public interest litigation. And civil society wasn't blind to many of the realities that all those whom I met in the 2000s in search of the state were well aware of. The Mai Bap Sarkar is a patronage state. It is a state that is, deeply that is deeply corrupt at the grassroots. It is a state that is predatory at the grassroots. The anthropologist Akhil Gupta used the word violence of the state as a way to describe the challenges of the state at the grassroots. Civil society recognized that the answer to this perhaps does not lie in getting rid of the state, which is what fueled the imagination of the state, at least in big capital markets, financial markets, and the experiences that I was having. They argued that the power of democracy can hold the state accountable. And that is how the grammar of accountability, transparency, right to information entered into the domain of the struggle for building a welfare state in India in the late 1990s and continued through to this day. 2004 was an important turning point. In the following sense, India had been experiencing now successive years of high growth between 7 to 8%. Um, it had also become a moment where the limitations of growth that was based on the back of high of services was beginning to show because there were large parts of the Indian economy that certainly had benefited from growth in that it managed to move out of abject poverty, about 140 million, but abject poverty just barely into what the World Bank describes as the vulnerable population. 50% of India, or 40% of India, sorry, still remain in a place where one single income shock can push you down to poverty. That income shock comes from health, it comes from having to spend high amounts on education, it comes from losing your job, uh, it comes from many things. And so the big question of what the Indian state needs to do for the mass of its population remained an open one. So as we were slowly beginning to build education infrastructure, we also then recognized that we need to do a lot more. And the ideas emerged from this bubbling of civic activism rather than from mainstream politics but it is the bubbling of civic activism and the role of the courts to a degree that created a new innovative way of thinking about the Indian state, uh, the Indian welfare state, through the mechanism of rights uh, and entitlements committing the Indian state to core welfare that it must deliver to its people. It was a hard and complex struggle, but the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, which saved all of us in the middle of the pandemic, the public distribution system that was highly derided uh, especially in the 2000s, but which eventually in 2013 got converted into the National Food Security Act, became, uh, uh, and also saved us through the pandemic, became core to 
the welfare state articulated in the framework of rights. We also implemented a right to education in 2010, which committed India towards universal education. Now, each of these rights, if you examine them independently, had embedded within them some strength and many challenges. But for me, the biggest strength that was embedded in these rights was A, that it was framed as rights. So genuine claim making of citizens was, was given. It was a big shift in the imagination from a my Baap Sarkar to citizens with rights that they could demand from the state. And it is because citizens have, were given these rights that the opportunity also opened up for the possibilities of experiments like social audits where citizens could directly demand from government things that government had stolen from them in their name. This period also coincided with the decadal uh, uh, long uh, experience of decentralizing politics with the 1992 and 93, 73rd and 74th constitution amendments, which created elected local governments. Finally, government was reaching genuinely to the people and as a sociologist Patrick Heller really evocatively described it, the surface area of the state was expanding. As the surface area of the state was expanding, the state began to be visible in all these places where I had traveled in the late 90s, early 2000s and encountered citizens desperately seeking the state. But now the challenge was different. We had rights, we created some experiments like social audits with, with democracy actually. There was nothing more democratic than citizens being able to go to the state and demand what is their right, rightfully. And the pressures of democracy meant that the state had to respond. But we also had to ensure that the state had the capacity or the capability to do what it had committed to. Implementation was the big challenge. The right to education, which uh, 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 Krishna Kumar sir mentioned about my early work in education, was a very important example precisely of this. We created a right that was in some ways trying to solve a problem in 2010 that we had already got to by 2005, gross enrollment, universalizing access to quite a high degree. The challenge now was different. The challenge was ensuring that all those who were entering the schooling system, in fact, were getting a high quality education. Year on year on year, the Asar survey reminds us that 50% of children that finish five years of schooling can barely read a standard two text. That building a school, empowering facilities is a useful, important first step and much still needs to be done. But we also need to focus on what is happening inside the classroom. That there are also limits to, to, to legal structures. Because for things to be justiciable, you also have to very clearly define what they are and convert accountability into something that can be accounted, literally, quite literally, in the government system if you don't have a voucher or a utilization certificate to show that you have spent money. What you spend money on is a different story. Uh, nothing actually works. The system doesn't move. So we, we reduce. Uh, just as we were building an accountability system that was genuinely empowering, where citizens had rights to claim on the state, the state itself was also reducing accountability to these limited checks and balances, converting accounting for accountability rather than asking what genuine accountability meant. In health, we built a network of primary health centers and sub-centers. There's still a long way to go, but the beginnings were made in a huge way. You see a huge shift in institutional delivery, women delivering children thanks to the Janani Suraksha Yojana, away from their homes into hospitals or primary health centers into institutions. But what about quality? We end, uh, a study by my colleague Jishnu Das and Jeffrey Hammer has repeatedly point, uh, uh, pointed out that the average MBBS public doctor spends 50% less effort and is 50% less likely to give you a proper diagnosis of even something as, as basic as diarrhea. Uh, because they're not really held that accountable for what they do. Compared to any other developing country, uh, they, they, they studied Indonesia, they studied Tanzania, uh, many of these quality challenges were significant. Absenteeism, a huge challenge. So really the question that, I, that, that, that came to me was, in this phase of the 1990s, as the state was exiting in some parts of the economy, did we just abandon the state entirely, even as we were busy in the process of uh, uh, expanding the surface area of the state and building a rights-based welfare state. Even as we were in some limited and halting fashion giving citizens rights to claim of the state. 
This has been the big Achilles heel, the capacity and the capability of the state to deliver and the urgency to invest in the state. One consequence of this, and I'll end in two minutes, uh, is that in more ways than one, we've become disenchanted with the Indian state. We are, all of us, looking constantly for private universities, private schools, private hospitals, private jobs. Uh, private jobs are good though, uh, but nonetheless, uh, but uh, we, we are, many of us have exited the state. Even the poor, if you look at education numbers, you'll be astounded to find that 50% pre-COVID of India was actually going to the private sector to educate themselves. In some ways, as citizens, we got disenchanted with the state, and maybe we stopped demanding that the state actually do the fundamentals of what it's supposed to do, protect our socio-economic rights. Of course, we did demand welfare. And that is why you see that the state, which also failed to build an economic growth path that was meant for all of us, didn't do very much to ensure the 40% of vulnerable population actually moved into the middle classes and had more secure uh, uh, economic freedoms, that uh, 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 the, the state too felt that it can't really do too much on these core fundamentals of providing health education and securing our rights. Instead, it started saying, well, maybe we can bypass the state altogether. Technology enables this a lot. And it is in this context that the current debate on universal basic income has gained a lot of significant traction. Politics will ensure, just as Ambedkar, I think, had anticipated, that the Indian state will always have to be some modicum of a welfare state. But politics has also created its own disenchantment with the capacity of the Indian state to respond to the hard challenges, particularly of investing in human development, health and education, nutrition, uh, being very critical ones. And so we are saying, we'll do more cash transfers, we'll do more freebies. I have no objection to cash transfers and freebies, but I do have objection to a politics that fails to invest deeply in the capabilities of each one of us. Because ultimately, at the heart of a welfare state, is a state that invests in capabilities and empowers us with freedom of choice. It is that empowerment that we are missing today. And we are somewhat locked in a vicious cycle because when you get disenchanted with the state, you also demand less of it. You demand what is easy of it. Increasingly, we are demanding some education from our states. Uh, the government of Delhi has, I think, excelled itself. I spent a lot of time in these schools in actually trying to make education a political agenda and fronting it. And that is changing, uh, that is creating some momentum across different parts of India to start taking health and education seriously. So maybe we are at a cusp of change, but for this cusp of change to translate into a deep and genuine welfare state that ensures and protects socioeconomic rights of all citizens, perhaps we need to shed our disenchantment with the state recognizing that the state can be very violent, especially on those who are completely disempowered, but also remembering that the best antidote to a violent state is democracy. So preserving our democracy, preserving our rights, and through that, shedding our disenchantment and demanding of the state what it ought to serve all of us with. That's at the heart of what is good public policy in India, and that's at the heart of what will make India a substantive welfare state that ensures socio-economic freedoms, along with political freedoms, which today are somewhat contested as well, for all of its citizens as it goes forward. Thank you. There are a few questions from the house. If somebody would like to ask a question or so. Yes, Ankit? Is there a rooming mic? There's no rooming mic. Yeah. Ankit, you could please come forward. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, there is a rooming mic. Yeah. Somebody could hear. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Thank you so much for the enthralling session. Uh, I have two questions. Number one, uh, this thing about you know about UBI that it will make people more la lazy or lethargic. How far do you think it's true? Number one. 
Number two is about local self governments. So we, as you just pointed out, that local self governments they are highly corrupt, they are casteist, and so on. Uh, so what do you think? You know, uh, as we know that as you reduce the electoral area, the probability of higher say caste politics it increases, right? They would be working for one specific block which would give them more votes, right? They do not need the minority per se, minority votes per se. So how do you think that, you know, that local self-governments, are they actually, uh, could help us out in the long run or not? Should we take a cluster of questions? And My question is that as neoliberalism is growing in popularity, how do policy structures look like under that? How do we keep equity up with efficiency? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, my question is that uh, political mobilization in India since the 1990s has been along the lines of caste and religion. So moving away from political mobilization, away from caste and religion towards rights-based mobilization, can it help in uh, welfare delivery and improving the, uh, or sub the substantivity of the welfare state? Thank you. Ma'am, I have a question about direct benefit transfer. So how effective is it? I am currently from Andhra Pradesh where I have seen many schemes about it. But I actually, at the ground level, I don't find it effective. So, there's any way that we can make it actually effective? Begin. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, these are really important questions. Um, let me try and, and tackle uh, each one of them. Um, will a universal basic income make people lazy? Uh, that's the laziest. Uh, I know it's an argument that people often make. It's the laziest argument I have ever found. Uh, universal basic income, especially in countries like ours, uh, there is enough evidence to tell you that investing in the poor, in every, in, in whichever way we do it, yields only positive outcomes in terms of productivity, in terms of enhancing the human capital, and in terms of economic growth. Uh, so no. However, um, it is a question to ask uh, for India at the moment whether a universal basic income, which I think at some level we already have, as you rightly said, the DBT in Andhra Pradesh is, I, I mean, there's a DBT for everything. Uh, so so it's its literally a universal basic income regardless. And it's not, uh, Andhra Pradesh is a more pronounced version of this, uh, but in many parts of the country, what used to be investments that we were making in the grassroots state are now converting into UBIs or into, into DBTs. Technology helps. It suits politics, particularly the nature of our current political moment, which is very uh, individualized or presidential in its own way. Uh, it allows for a political direct connect between political leadership. Uh, it allows you to centralize, which are the core of the political moment, both at the government of India level, national level, as well as in states. So there's a lot of political appetite for DVDs uh, as well. But it begs the question, are you investing in genuine springboards for, the, for people? genuine capability enhancement, or are these short-term measures? Um, if the world has limited resources, and that's a core challenge for, uh, uh, for, uh, for public policy, then it has to be a combination of investing in the state, along with investing in a certain degree of so social safety nets, like Narega, like possibly an urban NREGA, like some kind of DBT, certainly for certain, uh, for, for uh, specific communities. Uh, uh, vulnerable communities. Um, and that's really where we should be putting our focus on. I worry that the debate on UBI and DBT has become this perfect coming together of three different strands uh, of our current uh, welfare movement. One is the centralization and uh, personalized politics, which suits DBT very effectively. Second is, the is, uh, is, is this disenchantment with the state. Because we don't believe it can actually do many things, let's just bypass the state altogether. But I have seen DBT being implemented in many parts of the country. And I know that even basic challenges, like identifying the right target group, is not an easy one. It actually requires a very, very sophisticated state. 
And what we are doing without building the capacity of the state is completely centralizing decision making in a way that the poor citizen who has not received this finds themselves almost with nowhere, no, no grievance recourse and nowhere to go. Because you can't include people in a database, you can only perhaps at best have the powers to delete them in the database. So without building the capacity of the state, you bypass the state and create a whole set of other problems. And um, none of this means that corruption has fully gone away. It has come out and found its way in another form. The third element uh, uh, that is, I think, building this UBI DBT, which I find uh, challenging in the Indian ecosystem, is also that then it sort of builds together uh, an imagination that the state has sort of finished its responsibility by giving the DBT. It's not looking at the kinds of investments it needs to make in order to be able to ensure that all Indian citizens have the capacity to participate in the Indian economy, by which I mean in agriculture. There are many parts of India where you still have to actually even physically build the mandi, the market infrastructure. Uh, in education, many parts of India where the state plays an important role in shape or, or ought to play an important role in shaping and uh, making uh, the education system genuinely work. The kind of income stress, the fact that a large part of India is going into the private sector for education, that it places on consumption patterns, on income uh, amongst uh, vulnerable uh, households because the poorest are still going to the government schools, is significant. It's something to be asking for ourselves. Health, the fact that we a large percentage of Indian health expenditure is out-of-pocket expenditure in the private sector, raises important questions. So, um, you know, without investing in these uh, core aspects of the state, we assume that you finish your responsibility through uh, direct benefit transfers. And without investing in building markets so that services can reach everywhere, that's where the big challenge is. So instead of doing all of these things, DBT has sort of become the mantra. And I think it, 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 it allows the state to get away from doing the hard work that it ought to do. Um, to the question on neoliberalization, uh, I actually think the neoliberal moment is probably past its prime. Uh, and even if you, if you just look at COVID stimulus across the world, India was more neoliberal in her COVID that stimulus than most parts of the Western world. Uh, even as, and look at what's happening to the U.S. economy, it's interesting. Uh, you know, you, you, you have high inflation, but, uh, it, uh, you know, uh, also very low unemployment. So, so you know, d different things are happening in different parts of the world. The limits, I think, of neoliberalism have been reached. It is giving way now to, I think, to a, maybe a bigger evil, I don't know, but it's giving way to a populist, uh, right-wing, de de authoritarian democracy. We see the same thing happening, in my opinion, in India, uh, but that's also happening with a remarkable contradiction of its own, where we have a fairly limit neoliberal imagination of what we are supposed to do uh, in terms of stimulus. Uh, so we gave uh, credit guarantee. Now we are saying we're going to do more cap capital expenditure, public investment for private in to generate private investment, less in social safety nets. We are debating freebies. Uh, till the cows go come home. Uh, but at the same time, welfare is at the heart of our politics. No political party will say that I won this election without welfare. So, you know, how, how all these contradictions play out is where the future of the welfare state is going to rest. And ultimately, all these issues uh, come back to the issue of local self-government. I don't imagine the possibility of the Indian state being robust, strong, and accountable without it having strong uh, uh, self, uh, uh, strong institutions of local self-government. In fact, I think the biggest ruse has been this: uh, the argument of corruption, of elite capture, of caste politics that has uh, served a purpose of failing to power share with local governments in a way that it ought to. Uh, we have been too scared of these so-called realities of, uh, of, a, of our society to allow it to hold itself accountable. I think that's a problem. No country of the diversity and the scale of India has been able to achieve high levels of human development and economic growth without being genuinely decentralized. Without local self-governments, there will be no future. They are also the core of Indian democracy. If we worry about the state of Indian democracy today, we should be very worried about the fact that we have unfairly deprived our local governments of their rights and our citizens of their rights of holding local governments accountable for what they ask for. I think we should, uh, because there's a long day, otherwise they would have had more queries. Thank you so much.
you have for such an incredible and truthful insight. I hope we all will you know, learn from it and it will guide us throughout our life. Now I'd like to call upon one of the talented societies of our college, ALA, the Indian Music Society, for a performance of theirs.